Hello, me bonnie bairns, and welcome to episode five of the Superhero Dog Owner Show. This is the show that helps you have more fun and less stress with your pet dog. My name's Dom Hodgson. I am the host of the show, and I'm also the author of How to Be a Dog Superhero, which you can purchase at www.mydogsuperhero.com. Thanks to everyone who has... Uh, what have they done? They've been so busy this week. Thanks to everyone who has been in touch with us, told us they're enjoying the show. Thanks if you've signed up for the emails and they're, you're enjoying those. And thank you if you've left a review of the show as well on iTunes. We really appreciate that. It's great to know that we're providing some useful content. <laughs> we're not just sitting in a van talking about ourselves. There's people out there watching it and implementing and, and having more fun with their dogs because of what we're doing in the show. So in this week's episode, we have a, an, an awesome guest. He is a, a, a celebrity TV Uh, vet, uh, Mark the Vet, Mark Abraham. He was kind enough to give us a ton of his time this week to talk about many, many things. The main thing that I think you're going to take away from this is the issue of puppy farming. It's an issue that is, uh, it's been in the news a lot over the last year, especially, and certainly in the last few months um, with the Panama panorama documentary and stuff um but yeah mark's got some some fantastic things to share with you his story and how he got interested in in in, in working with animals is, is amazing so we're gonna we're gonna cut straight to the to the living room where we where we recorded the podcast earlier this week and uh yeah alex it's time to roll the video let's roll it uh, my guest today is mark abraham um, but we all know him better as mark the vet uh, mark is an author he's an animal welfare campaigner He's volunteered for animal rescue projects, including vaccinating dogs against rabies in Mumbai, rescuing dancing bears in the Ukraine. Uh, he's operating on moon bears in Chengdu, China. Is that right, Mark, as well? Correct, at the Animals Asia Sanctuary. Right. Uh, you've obviously been the resident vet on the Paul O'Grady Show, and um, I'm really delighted to have you here with us today. So thanks very much for joining me, Mark. Thanks for inviting me on. You're welcome. We're going to dive straight in with the, uh, the Greyhound round. This is six questions, and I'm going to mark you at the end of them, so, so be on the ball, okay? Um, no pressure. No pressure at all. Um, <laughs> who's your favourite superhero? My favourite superheroes are comedians. Okay. So I would say my favourite superhero is probably Peter Cook, although yeah. Larry David and Ricky Gervais come a close joint second and third. Yeah. Um, but Peter Cook, for me, the ultimate comedian, and for me, comedians are superheroes. Yes. So I may get judged zero out of ten for that, but that's... <laughs> I like it, I like it. No, we like laughing here, so that's good. Um, Indian or Chinese food? Depends. Depends on the state of the hangover. <laughs> Which brings me nicely to my next question. Red or white wine? Uh, usually red. Okay. Favourite dog cartoon character? Well, do you know what? You told me about this, and I, the first one that sprang to mind was Hong Kong Fooey. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I think that um, if you're talking about animation, then I think some of the banana splits in the, in the early 70s were also dogs. They were good fun too. They so were really good anything fun. of that ilk, yeah. <laughs> uh, showing my age, I know I'm old. but That's yeah, all right, that's fine. That's and fine. The Littlest Hobo, although it wasn't a cartoon, it was a children's programme. I think Littlest Hobo was a massive inspiration to all of our generation of animal lovers. Definitely, definitely. The big TV fan, anyway. Yeah, I was it back then because there was nothing else to do. <laughs> so <laughs> pre-internet, pick... guys. Whoever's watching, pre-internet, <laughs> we did stuff. Pick a walk. Pointer in the park or a beagle on a beach. Always beach. I live in Brighton. Um, I love the beach. I live right by the beach, so always the beach. Yeah, no, no question about that. <laughs> Thanks for that. All right, I'm going to give you eight out of ten for that, Mark. That's pretty good. I'm quite eight. Impressed. Where did I slip up? I need to not learn so I can improve. Oh, Indian or Chinese, you, you just dithered. I didn't commit, <laughs> did I? <laughs> um, so we, uh, we're going to go on and talk a bit about, more about um, Pup Aid and some of the work that you're doing with animal welfare. Um, but let's find a little bit more about you. Before you, were, before you were Mark the Vet and you were just Mark the Kid growing up, what, what, what sort of compelled you to, to want to get involved with, with animals or you know, who inspired you to, 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 work, to work with animals? Um, I was always a little geeky, nerdy, um, caterpillar collecting weird kid <laughs> who didn't really have many human friends and preferred sort of to hang around in, um, in fields and woodlands and, and collect birds' eggs, um, obviously from the ground that were cracked. I didn't go into nests and steal them. Um, <laughs> but I was always obsessed with nature. I came from a background 
uh, with both parents loved animals. I think that's really important. We always had pets. We had tortoise and we had um, we always had cats. And occasionally we had all sorts of insects brought in by myself. Um, but yeah, it was always an animal related. Um, and the, the story goes, so I remember very vaguely, but my mum's pretty sure of this happening. happening. Um, our pet tortoise had a, uh, a cut in its leg and uh, it had a maggot in it. And um, I removed it with a twig when I was three and the leg got better. And I think that made me want to help animals. Um, and from then on, I always wanted to help animals. And, and my uncle was a vet. Um, so I kind of knew about the profession. Um, so I just wanted to be a vet from a very young age. And I'm quite single minded. So if I want to do something, um, I kind of try and put my mind to it and, and do it. So my whole childhood was very geeky and very nerdy and very information um, obsessed and it was about butterflies and moths and birds and trees. Um, and that extended to capital cities and, and flags of aeroplanes and anything sort of information hoarding. I loved and I, I, I draw as well. I'm called Mark because I'm named after Mark Chagall, the artist, right. because my dad was a, a, a painter. Um, so I used to draw everything as well. So it was like collecting and drawing and birds and, and butterflies. And it was just a really geeky, <laughs> nerdy um childhood that yeah. yeah that i loved homework i couldn't do enough homework and then when i finished homework i used to invent more homework um so yeah i was um in terms of uh, being a being a child i was the least rebellious child you could possibly imagine <laughs> and and i got straight a's and and good results because um i just loved working yeah and i had to be a vet that was the only thing i wanted to do brilliant brilliant right so it all started with a tortoise it all started with a tortoise, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So you you just mentioned about your, your sort of single mindedness and stuff, and that's something that I've as as I've been doing a bit of research for the interview, I've, I I kind of picked up on. You're you're incredibly passionate about animal welfare, and the list of charities that you're patron of is long and varied. From you know the Oldies Club to the Labrador Retrievers, the Mayu Home. I'm guessing if there was more hours in the day, you would support even more animal welfare issues, you know? So is that where the drive comes from? You just, you, f you feel like you want to help as many causes as you can? Yeah, kind of. Um, I, I think my background plays a lot to do with this because I come from a family of, uh, on one side, sort of Holocaust survivors and on one side, sort of Spanish Inquisition survivors many, many years ago. So, I, I, you know, my grandma who escaped the Holocaust, she's still alive, she's 96. Um, so I've got it in me sort of to always, I guess, um, be aware of the underdog and looking out for the underdog and sort of standing up for um, fairness in a way. Um, so for me, campaigning isn't really campaigning. It's just standing up for the little guys who haven't got a voice. And that's usually the most vulnerable in society, in this case, animals. Um, and I just, I just find it impossible to say no, first of all. If I like a charity, if I like a campaign, I'll do what I can to help it um, because every animal deserves a chance. Um, it sounds very cliche, but it's true. So, yeah, whether it's um, moon bears in China or it's, um, as you said, the bears in the Ukraine or travelled all around the world doing stuff, they're all animals and they all deserve to be happy and healthy and, and their welfare needs provided and satisfied. Um, so I try and do as much as possible and I love it as well. It's mm -hmm. not like it's a chore. I actually really enjoy it. So I think the background of always sort of, pardon the pun, looking out for the underdog um, kind of drives me because I also played a lot of chess when I was younger and I think that develops your brain into being quite strategic. So you don't really take no for an answer and you don't really think an obstruction or someone getting in the way is going to end your sort of path of campaigning, if you like. It just makes you think, OK, why have they done that? There must be a reason for that because all you're doing at the end of the day is carving a way uh, for the animals to have a better existence. So if someone's getting in the way of that and it happens a lot, sometimes 10 times a day. There's usually a reason for that. It's usually a vested interest of some sort or some relationship with a maybe a pet food company or, you know, we, often you never know, maybe for a year or two years or three years. And then after a while, it's like, oh, that's why that happened then. So there's always a reason, but they're in the wrong. If anyone obstructs sort of animal welfare, mm -hmm. um, what do you call it, sort of some sort of positive change, yeah it can very very rarely be justified mm -hmm. so you're trying to 
sort of, for, sort of investigate and you're trying to expose and Find you're trying to around it, basically you? understand why that person, organisation, individual, MP, doesn't matter, mm. is behaving in that way. And there's usually a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've done a pretty good job so far of, of finding a way around, uh, you know, and, and being determined and, and, and you know, with, with the puppet thing, which we're going to talk about now, you know, the... Uh, no. There's been a lot of press coverage over the last month or so with uh, the Panorama program that I know you you played a part in as well when it was exposing the, the puppy farms. And so, could you tell us the story about how you first became aware of puppy farms and 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 how you got into all that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was a practicing vet as I am now. I don't do as much now, which is a shame. I miss it, but I'm in obviously Westminster a lot and doing other stuff, all animal welfare related. Um, but I was running an emergency clinic in Brighton. And for those of you who don't know, emergency clinics sort of um, are subscribed to by surrounding practices. So they, we provided an out of our service, which means that the vets can have a nights off and weekends off. And we concentrate on the emergencies and hospitalization. Um, and it was on a Friday night. I came in to do my night shift at 6 p.m. And seven puppies came in, all on drips, from one from each sort of subscribing practice. Um, and they all were suffering from parvovirus, which is a dis disgusting, horrific um, and quite shocking disease that really, really young puppies suffer from. Um, it rips their insides to pieces. They vomit diarrhea classically with blood in. And they don't usually last uh, more than 24 hours if they've got it. Um, it's all about detecting it early. It's all about getting the treatment on board, you know, taking the pain away. It's very, very painful. Uh, and it's a classic disease that's that's sort of caught, if you like, and, and transmitted on puppy farms mm -hmm. or commercial breeders or even uh, non-commercial breeders, but with poor husbandry, mm -hmm. commonly with puppies bred on uh, and born on straw or shavings, you know, not the classic home environment yeah. that's hygienic. So it was a bit, that was the first alarm bell. It's like, how can seven puppies come in with this disease when normally in a practice you see one a month maybe or one every few weeks so that was alarm bells so i kind of rang all these owners up and said where did you get the puppies from and it was all from the same place some were from the same litter um and it was a, a puppy farm dealer just outside brighton who was buying them in from a puppy farm in wales um but the crucial point of the story is um the puppy farm in wales was licensed and legal and the puppy farm dealer was also licensed and legal so what shocked me a this, I didn't really realise the scale of how puppies came to market, if you like, and how they can come from Wales to Brighton and still be eight weeks old. Um, you know, what possibly, how can that be justified? Um, but also the fact that it was legal, it was legitimised. Um, so I kind of looked into it and, and was shocked. And I was a, still am a, um, a pet industry professional, if you like, um, and didn't know enough, even even with what I was doing. So I thought, if I don't know, then how can the public make an informed decision with all due respect? Um, so I set about educating. And so Pup Aid started really as a dog show. It was a celebrity judge dog show in Brighton um, with well-known personalities and TV people and MPs who judged this fun dog show and raised awareness about the correct way to choose a dog, which is obviously to see it with its mum if you want a puppy uh, or to go to a rescue. Um, that's it. So you don't go to dealers and you don't go to um, pet shops and garden centres and anywhere without the mum. Uh, it's also, also important to realise that rescue centres have puppies too. So this was like quite a, a, a crucial sort of mission statement, if you like, which hasn't changed since since 2009 when we started Pup Aid. Um, first dog show was, was fun. It was... Um, it was kind of a success. I lost a lot of money personally because I didn't know what I was doing. It was just me organising it, and I was organising trade stands, and 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 all sorts of things went horrifically wrong that I ended up paying for. But I knew on the day that there was something in it, and we had live music, and we had, as I say, trade stand personalities. Michael Watson, the boxer who was brain damaged mm -hmm. by Chris Eubank, he judged best boxer dog. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the moment I realised that there's, there's definitely something in this because people came from a long way with their boxes to be judged by him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then the most poignant part of the day, which we still do, is the parade of the ex-breeding bitches rescued from puppy farms. So it's like everyone's having fun. Uh, and then there's a really serious bit which people take home with them. And then after a couple of years, um, Meg Matthews came on board, uh, Nell Gallagher's uh, ex-wife. She had a puppy farm, Boston Terrier, that needed four five thousand pounds worth of corrective surgery. So she was angry and she wanted help. And we both decided. I'm from Northwest London, so she, we both decided to move Pape to Northwest London. 
Um, so it went to Primrose Hill, where it still is, every September. Um, and it's just become bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we have sort of 80 trade stands and, you know, thousands of people came last year. We still have the parade of ex-breeding bitches, we have vegan food. We have, like, proper live music festival mm -hmm. stage. Have there's, a go another show coming, there's another show coming up this year? There's another one Yeah, planned? 3rd of September, 3rd of September. And, and in Primrose Hill. And it's a free show. You know, we rely on our sponsors who are fantastic. And our main sponsor is Barking Heads Dog Food. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 really, it's a it's a it's a one day festival for dog lovers. There's fantastic sort of boutique trade stands, um, and yeah, and then we still have the sort of parade of ex breeding bitches. But the the, the celebrities that have attended in the last few, like Ricky Gervais and Liam yeah. Gallagher and Brian May, Sarah Harding, Al McPherson, Rachel Riley, um, Susie Dent, um, Sue Perkins. Peter Egan, obviously, uh, it's, it's just unbelievable now. You know, stars from TOWIE and stars from yeah, yeah. Made in Chelsea. And, and these are the stars that are taking the message to the masses. And then, of course, that was fine. And the awareness is fantastic in the tabloid media for maybe one or two days of the year. Uh, and then, of course, it wasn't enough. So I started lobbying and then the lobbying Caroline Lucas said do an e-petition, so we did an e-petition and we got 100,000 signatures yeah. in six months. And that won us a debate in the main chamber three-hour debate and that kind of flushed out the bad guys mm -hmm. um because all the mps voted unanimously for a ban on puppies without their mums which is third party sales mm -hmm. but the government front bench uh, didn't like that um and they said let's just keep things kind of as they are but i off the back of that lots of stuff came out that was going on behind the scenes which i had no idea about i'm just an idiot caterpillar collecting nerd going into parliament thinking i can change stuff for dogs um so it's it's been, it's been a battle with a few organisations, I'll be honest with you. It's incredibly stressful. Um, but now we're in a position um, where there's an EFRA Select Committee inquiry going on into animal welfare. We've been called into evidence to, to give MPs, which is kind of unheard of for a campaign group. Um, we're providing documents and, and launches in Parliament and drop-in sessions for MPs and surveys and data and all sorts of things happening, reports. So slowly but surely, um, I have a fantastic coalition I work with including Cariad and, and the Carlton Index and people like Julia Carr. And we work but under the radar. Um, we're, we're not there to sort of grab headlines for what we do. We're just there to save the dogs. And again, it sounds quite cliche, mm -hmm. um, but it's quite a simple solution to end puppy farming. And that's basically to open up the puppy farms and turn them into sort of large scale ethical breeders, yeah. whether they're... Um, whether they're 200 breeding bitches or 10, it doesn't matter. If you can see the pup with the mum, there's enrichment programs for each puppy. They get exercise, it's staffed. The food is, is, is decent food and the water is clean and there's lighting and there's, and there's ventilation. It doesn't matter um, where they're bred, as long as they're bred uh, um, responsibly and the puppies they produce that enter our society are well adjusted. And of course, their mums are not bred to death. Yeah. So there is a solution, but it's the organisations and the individuals who think that dealing and legitimising dealing um, and, and pet shops and all these third party ways of selling hmm. are appropriate yeah. and justified are obstructing any possible progress in animal welfare. And it's very, very sad. And that's what we're up against every day as campaigners. So what can, say there's a family out there now, they're listening to the podcast, they're, they're thinking about getting a, a dog or a puppy. What can they do? You, Tell them what they what they sh definitely should do to ensure that they don't get a puppy bread farm and they get a nice, healthy, happy puppy. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's very straightforward, really. I mean, first we do your research. Um, second of all, you go along to the breeder, preferably at sort of five weeks or four weeks. The puppies are that old. Um, you have a first viewing, so there's no chance you're going to come away with one. Mm. The breeder vets you. You vet them. Lots of questions. You think about it. And then you maybe reserve one and you go back at eight weeks or nine weeks and you come away with it then. Mm -hmm. The problem is, or I mean, that's if you're buying a, a well-bred puppy. Um, my first choice would always be to recommend going to a rescue center. Go to your local rescue center. There's puppies there, as we said before. But there's also dogs that are there as a result of broken homes or people with no money or people that have got into temporary accommodation um, or people that have died. Mm -hmm. um, these are dogs that... Um, are chipped, they're usually neutered, they're vaccinated, they're wormed, they're fleed, they're usually house trained. So they're kind of bargains really yeah, yeah, in the yeah. in the grand scheme mm -hmm. of things when you think about how much a pedigree puppy or a designer crossbreed puppy costs, which can be anything up to three thousand pounds. 
Um, if you're buying, if you're buying a, a puppy, the golden rule is always see the mum. Um, the government's advice is to always see the mum. However, the same government's always also licensing establishments to sell the puppy hundreds of miles from the mum. Mm. So that's where the hypocrisy and the confusion lies, right at the top of the pyramid. So the, the public really have to make an informed decision, which is hard because there's even welfare organisations that aren't anti-pet shop, mm. which is crazy yeah. because the science is all there to prove that selling anywhere away from the mum is detrimental to not just the puppy's welfare, not just the mother's welfare, but also to the prospective dog owner's welfare as well. So there's, it's a minefield. Yeah. Um, little, a few little tips. Obviously, you always see the mum. Make sure it's not a fake mum. There are fake mums now, and that's, and, and that's pretty easy to work out because the, the mum interacts with the pups. The yeah. fake mum doesn't really care. Um, and also Google mobile numbers or Google landline numbers or Google any information you have about that person selling the dog. And you may be amazed at how many pages on Google come up with different litters for sale. Yeah, yeah. Also, finally, that the, the sign of a responsible breeder is usually one that just breeds one breed of dog at the maximum two uh -huh. um, because they're obsessed with that breed. That breed is their yeah, family. Yeah, yeah. If you turn up somewhere and they've got all a list of breeds, cockapoos and mm. multipoos and schnoodles and schnauzers and poodles, mm. you kind of know something's a bit dodgy. Yeah. Um, always ask to see where the puppy's bred as well. So there's lots of things that people can do. Yeah, if, if you're suspicious, you just walk away. Yeah. Ask your vet. You know, there's plenty of people around to give you advice. Brilliant. Great advice, Mark. Thanks for that. We, we already mentioned about your um, animal welfare. We'll come to the end of the interview now. Um, what can people do, you know, if, if there's some caterpillar collecting nerds out there in their own little villages all around the, the, the UK, what, what can they do to get involved with animal welfare in, in, in their own little way? Um, well, first of all, I think if they're on social media, then follow the animal welfare accounts. Um, follow myself, so I'm Mark Levet on Twitter and Facebook. Um, follow people like Peter Egan, follow Ricky Gervais, follow Brian May, uh, Cariad. Um, follow accounts that are already doing it and get a flavour for it and, and find out kind of which campaigns you're really interested in, which campaigns don't really do it for you. There's plenty out there. From the you know the Yulin Dog Meat Festival to Sea World to the Taji Dolphins um, captive uh, lion um, trophy hunting you know canned hunting lion petting um, there's enough out there internationally there's enough in this country fox hunting for example badger culling puppy farming there's enough um, so you can either decide to support all of it or you can decide to support one of them um, and then most campaigns will have rallies. Um, most campaigns will have um, petitions or, or get-togethers or gatherings or debates in Parliament. They'll, if they're actively campaigning, they will be doing stuff that invites people to support them. Mm -hmm. So get in touch. You know, the thing about campaigning is it's it's a real people power thing, and I think these days more than ever with social media, it's so accessible to to challenge brands or individuals or to join in the you know the, the mob, if you like, the power of the mob and create change. So get out there, go to dog shows, um, talk to people in charities, you know, volunteer at local rescues and walk dogs. Mm. There's so many levels that you can do. Start a petition, share a petition, sign a petition, tell your friends about a petition. Don't ignore stuff mm. um, because the more people that see stuff and are able to share and comment, the quicker change will come. Uh, and don't be afraid of challenging people. And, and if they don't answer, just keep asking them why they're refusing to answer. And eventually they will. <laughs> good advice. Good <laughs> advice. Um, so when you're not, uh, you know, helping raise awareness for puppy farms or being an author or traveling the world, what, what, is, <laughs> what is Mark Abram like to do to, to chill out? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I live in Brighton, so I'm very lucky to live in, in a very nice part of the world. Um, I walk on the beach, I go to the pub, um, my passions, I guess, are football, so I'm an Arsenal fan, mm -hmm. although I do go to Brighton regularly at the Amex, because I just love watching live football, yeah, uh, I go year, to a yeah. lot of stand-up comedy, um, and I, yeah, I just sort of hang out with my friends and, and just sort of talk about stuff that isn't to do with being a vet or animal welfare, so there are, <laughs> it is nice to escape, and that's yeah, usually, nice it's usually on the weekend, and it's really important. Um, but you know what? I, I, if it's not watching football or watching comedy, it's to, or walking on the beach. It's just nice to chill at home and let things sort of soak in. And, and I think the more relaxed you are, the more likely you are to then come up with different strategies and different ideas. So downtime is really important. And obviously, I'm, I do vet sometimes still at Meridian Vets and Peacehaven, which I love. 
Um, it's a real classic sort of independent, um, real personal practice, very anti-corporate, which I am too. Um, but, you know, I'm in Westminster a lot. So I'm in Westminster every week lobbying MPs and doing all sorts of things up there. So it's a very varied life. I never knew this even existed as the caterpillar collecting nerd now sort of standing up in Parliament and, and arguing and challenging and, and getting involved in quite heated discussions and public speaking. Uh, it's c kind of the opposite, really. Um, but I do genuinely feel that I'm doing the right thing for animals and helping them, which is kind of what I set out to do for a very young age. Yeah. It's just gone to a mental scale. And I'm so thankful to sort of the Pup Aid supporters and also the celebs that are involved with Pup yeah. Aid and and how many people have embraced it, understood it, and are willing to sort of carry the message as well. Because, again, it's, it, it's all about the power of the mob yeah. um, and pressure and, and it's kind, of, kind of clever strategy. But it is all animal welfare-based. It's evidence-based. A lot of it's common sense-based. And it's amazing, amazing, amazes me every day how many people still try and get in the way with individually organisations or whatever, mm -hmm. thinking that their way is better way than science has proven or that common sense is saying yeah. or that behaviorists say um, just for vested interests mm -hmm. so the more stuff is challenged the more stuff is exposed the more people kind of slip up and say things they wish they wouldn't and for me that's the most exciting part of campaigning because the more pressure you put on an individual or organization at some point they're going to slip up and it's going to be detrimental to them um, but at the moment it's detrimental to dogs and it's 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 making that switch yeah well I think you'll inspire a lot of people to hopefully step up and, and join the campaign. So I want to thank you very much for your time today, Mark, and, and wish you all the best for the future. And hopefully we'll have you back on the show again sometime in, in, in the future as well. Yeah, that's great. And, and if, if everyone watching... Um, yeah, can, where can they go uh, to find out more about you? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, no it's, uh, I'm easy. I just Google Mark the Vet and then I've got a website and social media channels and stuff. But I'd love to see everyone at Pup Aid, which yeah. is in Primrose Hill on the 3rd of um, September. Follow Pup Aid on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, and, and come along and be a part of animal welfare awareness and change and meet a bunch of people, that sounds a bit American, meet a bunch of people uh, who care and who have empathy and compassion and genuinely want to improve the world for, for the animals that, um, that kind of are our pets, but they also help us. You know, dogs are sniffer dogs and they're... Um, mm -hmm they detect epilepsy and they're yeah, guide, yeah. guide yeah. dogs, hearing dogs, assistance dogs. And it's in 2016, we're still farming them as, as livestock. Mm. So it's really now time to say enough is enough. Let's prioritize the welfare of the animals that are helping us uh, and support them as much as we can. And that's what Pup Aid is aiming to do. And if anyone wants to get on board, you're more than welcome. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much again for your time. I'll put those uh, links in the show notes as well underneath so people can come along and, and oh, cool. hopefully Thank see you. you then as well. So uh, thanks again for your time, Mark. My pleasure. Take care. You too. Take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye. So I hope you found that incredibly useful. I certainly did. I mean, uh, obviously I'm aware of puppy farms and I'm aware, I, I was aware of, of how, you know, ho what, what horrible places they can be. But, I mean, I don't know, Alex, were you as aware of that? And, no, and did the... definitely not. I think he highlighted something that's a really important issue, obviously, and something that whether you're a dog owner now, currently, or, or you're looking to be, it's something people should definitely be aware of. Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. So if you, you know, if you have a puppy, or if you, you know, if you're getting a puppy, or you're thinking about getting a puppy, or you know somebody who's thinking about getting a puppy, please, please, please share that episode with them because, you know, just, just with what Mark shared with us in the episode there is, is going to be able to hopefully give them enough information to, to, to know where and where not to, to, to get their new puppy from. We've got some more cool interviews coming up in the coming weeks, um, but next week we're going to be... Um, giving you some some more practical how-to things that you can start putting into practice with your dog straight away. I know a lot of you have been trying to find the dog's kryptonite. You've been having a lot of fun. Some people haven't had as much success as others. We'll be talking about that as well, um, which is to be expected. You know, nobody's dog looks at them like they're a superhero the first time they try to play with them. But it, So in next week's episode, we're going to be giving you some, some more practical how-to things, tips of how you can you know kickstart your dog training really yeah i know you obviously if you've been watching the show and we were six episodes in almost and if you've been watching the show this long hopefully you're on board with what we're talking about you want to have more fun with your pet dog so so in next week's episode we're going to give you some practical tips to, to kickstart your dog training and really help you really help you get started and, and having more fun and 
and less stress on your daily dog walk. So please, if you're enjoying the show, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes as well. That's it for this week. Thanks for your time, Alex. Thank you guys for watching. And if we don't see you through the week, then we'll see you through the window. See you next time.